food, glorious food, hot sausage and mustard. While we're in the mood, cold jelly and custard, peas, pudding, and savreloy. What next is the question? Rich gentlemen, have it, boys. Indigestion. I just want to point out that I'm about to give a short talk on obesity in a country named Hungary. As uh, Kremlin pointed out in uh, his introduction, we can present the science and the evidence and the facts and the guidelines on obesity and nutrition till the cows come home. But in fact, actual change happens culturally, not through information. And there are neurological reasons for that. Uh, when we give you a piece of information, of evidence, it goes to our frontal cortex, the, the seat of our conscious thought and problem solving. Unfortunately, in our evolution, that's not really connected to the part of our brain that is associated with identity and choice and behavior. That's the midbrain, that's the amygdala, the hippocampus, the seat of long-term memory. And that's connected to our primal drives, the lizard brain, our sensory experience of the world, and the seat of mirror neurons, uh, empathy. And, and the way to access that part of the brain is through the arts. So if we're really talking about shaping behavior, um, the way to do that, the pathway, from an evolutionary point of view, is the arts. And what's interesting about it is that it's not directive. Um, yes, as uh, Hans pointed out in his introduction, part of what we're talking about is effective health messaging. But in fact, when we start looking at the science of the arts, um, we begin to realize that the creative instinct, the need to find meaning, the need to create something out of nothing, to find a path through meaninglessness and chaos is as much a part of our well-being as it is a tool to find health. It is health. Um, when, when we talk about the arts and obesity, uh, I'd like to look at it through several lenses. Uh, on the one hand, the arts are an interesting mirror of our perceptions of obesity over the millennia. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, on the other hand, the arts have done a lot of damage to body image. Uh, over time, and, and it's not necessarily a, a magic bullet uh, that, in fact, media and the arts and imaging has played a significant role in increasing the obesity epidemic. And then lastly, uh, I'm going to touch on the use of, of cooking and eating and the aesthetic experience as an art form and as a way of, of finding that mindfulness to find a pathway to health and well-being. But fundamentally, it gets back to the WHO definition of health, as Nils pointed out, that health, according to the WHO 1947 constitution, is not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. It is the attainment of the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. And so when we think about that, what does that mean? That means that Health is not just extending our lives at all costs, no matter how much suffering we're going through or what, what abysmal emptiness that life may contain. It's about joy. It's about living in the present moment. It's about thriving. And, and in particularly when we start talking about under and over nutrition, which WHO defines as two sides of the same, co same coin, we, we have to understand that if we medicalize obesity as a problem to get rid of, that actually increases the problem. Uh, that it's, it's about a way of living. It's not about um, stigmatizing the person with obesity that you have a medical condition that you have to stop and you're on your own. Um, the causes of it are not necessarily individual causes. They are very much connected to the society that has grown up around us. So 
Let's go back to the song that I began with. It's from a musical called Oliver, which is based on the uh, Charles Dickens novel, Oliver Twist. And what's interesting about that song to me is that the image of thinness is associated with poverty. It's associated with the orphans trying to get a little more food. And the obese character is Mr. Bumble, uh, who is the figure of authority. Uh, and in, in that, period of time, uh, obesity was, was emerging as a symbol of, of, of power, of wealth, but also to a certain degree malevolence and, and clowning. Mr. Bumble, you know, he, he was clumsy, right? Um, if we go back in time to the very first image of obesity in artistic representation, it's the Venus of Willendorf. Uh, and even if you don't know the name, you've probably seen the image. It's a stone carving that's like all boobs and butt. You know, it's a, a symphony of circles. Uh, and, uh, and there's almost no head. The emphasis is definitely on the boobs and the butt, um, which tells you something about female identity as well uh, at that point. But it wasn't a negative symbol. It, f for all we know, it's 30,000 years old, but it was a symbol of fertility and of wealth. And throughout most of human history in the 30,000 years that have passed since, obesity has always been a sign of wealth, of happiness, of success. Um, there were very few negative associations. Dionysus, the god of wine, was always portrayed as obese. He, he symbolized enjoying life and uh, enjoying that aesthetic experience constantly. He was the god of the theater. Uh, of, of how to live your life in the present moment. Uh, in, in Latin mythology, Pluto, the god of the underworld, the god of wealth, was often portrayed as obese. Uh, even up to the paintings of Rubens, uh, of, of seeing uh, plump women and men uh, enjoying their bourgeois life, uh, th there was nothing negative about it. It was, it was showing that they had wealth and they were living well, and it was something to aspire to. Uh, and uh, and even in uh, religious paintings, when, when baby Jesus was, was, was portrayed throughout much of uh, Western art, it was always a fat baby, you know, overly fat. Uh, and there was something that happened in the Industrial Revolution after the Reformation where this notion of thrift and waste began to come in and the perceptions of, of obesity began to change. And that combined with the mass production of food and the cheaper availability of sugar, uh, suddenly um, the role of obesity in the public mindset began to invert so that now uh, when we think of obese people, we think of people in poverty. And when we think of rich people, we think of people thin as rails. Um, in Oliver, I actually performed in a production of Oliver. Uh, I played Fagin. And I, I actually starved myself for that role. And I, I had it as a young actor, just, just this notion that, uh, like many method actors, that, uh, you know, as, as Laurence Olivier once said to Dustin Hoffman, it would be much simpler just to act. Uh, but as young actors, we want to actually be those things. So I starved myself to like this skin and bones to do it. And unfortunately, it began this roller coaster in my life of extreme uh, weight loss and gain uh, over the course of the next uh, few decades. And as an actor, I was under constant pressure about my, my physical appearance. And granted, what I experienced as a male actor was a fraction of what most female actors uh, experience, but it was still quite powerful for me. Uh, and I didn't admit it at the time because I just thought it was part of the business. But to be told by an agent or a casting director that I was too fat for a role, and looking at those photos now, I was like, I looked normal, you know? And said, if you're going to be fat, you need to be, you know, 40 kilos fatter so you can actually play a fat man, but you're in this middle area so you're not castable. And, 
And you know, as an actor, that didn't make a lot of sense to me because we, we learned all the techniques of how to change our body's appearance for a role so, you know, by using focal points in the body. So if I wanted to play a fat man, I could just move the focal point to my belly and you know, just walk like this, and suddenly I become obese. And if I wanted to transform into uh, an athlete, I would put my focal point into my chest and I would walk like this and my body image, my sense of self would immediately change. Or if I wanted to be an intellectual, I put my focal point in my eyes and you know, my body would transform just through movement. That the, the superficial appearance of our body was something different than how our bodies actually move through space and what our sense of ownership over them was. Um, needless to say, uh, I had a moderately successful acting career. I was able to earn my living at it. But the toll that that took on my sense of self uh, was more than I admitted to myself. So that when I finally started having babies and realized I had to feed them and all of that and started getting a real job, um, Part of my release from that world of acting was to say, fuck it, I don't care what I eat anymore. And the result was, in a fairly short period of time, I gained about 40 kilos. And after I lost the weight, I tried an experiment. I actually took my son's uh, book bag and I filled it with 40 kilos worth of books and then just put it on my front to see what it was like to carry that weight around. And I thought, oh my god, I spent years carrying this around? But it, it, was, it was something that was always um, a conflict for me because as an obese person, I experienced that feeling that you get when you walk down an airplane aisle and people start turning away, praying that you don't sit next to them. You know, and, and facing that kind of stigma every day, I began to think this is just not fair. You know, and, and, and with images on, on television, uh, reinforcing this, this norm of the impossibly thin person uh, as something to achieve, and that somehow uh, being fat meant that you had to joke all the time, you had to be clumsy, you had to be outrageous, uh, uh, and, and, and you were probably not trustworthy, you were probably lazy. All of these things are not particularly true for any body type. Um, I, I, I began to think, you know, I, I should just be who I am. And so I understood that body positive m movement. But I also began to realize that I would break out into a terrible sweat if I climbed one flight of stairs. I began to realize that I, I was sleepy all the time, that I wasn't sleeping at night. Um, my heart would race, not just with a minimal amount of physical activity, but in an uh, enervated emotional state. Um, I was not well. Uh, and, and frankly, working at WHO wasn't helpful. Um, to travel all the time be on airplanes, to go to meetings, be sitting all day, having these buffets where it's all carbs, uh, contributed to my decline. I, uh, when I was staff association president, I used to refer to WHO as the World Unhealthy Organization because <laughs> it was terrible to work there. I mean, we, we, we did wonderful things for the world, but we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to ourselves. Yeah, and, and, and this was a problem. But on the other hand, I did have access to nutritionists at WHO, professional ones. And I, I one day just randomly in the cafeteria of all places began talking to someone who specializes in obesity. And, uh, and of course, being polite, they're not gonna bring it up, right? And I'm kind of embarrassed to bring it up because I'm fat. And uh, I finally broke the ice and said, you know, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but I, I have tried to diet and I just get you know, these cravings and I, I lose five pounds and then I gain six and I, I am good and then I reward myself and I, I just, I go on this roller coaster. What can I do? And she said to me, 
well, what is it that you're not eating? And so I, I said, well, I'm trying to avoid fat, I'm trying to do this, that. I said, what's your intake of sugar? And I thought for a moment, I thought, well, not much. I mean, do you drink fruit juice? Well, yeah, that's sugar. You know, um, do, you, do you eat white pasta? That's sugar. Do you drink alcohol? That's sugar. Uh, and she began to sort of clue me in to this whole of the world that I hadn't considered. And she began to explain that um, ketosis, that process of, of weight loss, where your body suddenly goes into burning the extra fat rather than storing it, is not triggered by fat consumption, it's triggered by sugar levels in the bloodstream. And that if you can keep your sugar levels steady, not too low, not too high, you go into ketosis and a constant state of, of fat loss. Uh, and so the key was sugar. And so uh, I thought, okay, I'll try that. And I started not consuming sugar. And I found that I couldn't sleep, I got headaches, uh, uh, I, I couldn't concentrate, I had terrible cravings. So I went back to her and I explained what, what I was going through and she said, um, you're going through withdrawal. Your body is addicted. And I said, well, so should I do it gradually? Should I, no, 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 go cold turkey. It'll take you six weeks for your body to reset. But after that six weeks, it'll be like a veil is lifted. So I toughed it out. It was the toughest six weeks of my life. But when it was over, oh my God, I slept through the night. In the afternoon, I didn't feel like taking a nap. Um, my creativity began to explode. Uh, it, it, it really was, my body had forgotten what it was like to be without sugar. And uh, it, it radically changed, not just my physical health, but the way I engaged the world. And I began a slow, steady decline where I lost 40 kilos. Uh, exercise was a part of it, but she said, it's not about burning calories. It's about using exercise to regulate blood sugar levels. And, uh, and the same thing with uh, high fiber uh, foods like brown breads or brown rice or whatever. It, it's, if you eat enough of it, you still get the same glycemic load. So you have to be modest in what you eat. But by eating the fiber, it, it levels the sugar, it, it, the sugar is absorbed into your body more slowly over time, so you can stay within that state of ketosis. Yeah. So I tried all of that, and lo and behold, it began to work. And I, I, I began to think about my own family's history of obesity, because if you look at family photos, before the 1970s, everyone in my family looked normal. And and my family were a bunch of tennis players, and, and they, they tried to eat wisely, and they would buy the lean cuisines and, and all of this. And, um, and yet, after the 1970s, they all became obese. How is that possible? Well, now we know, because the food industry was replacing fat with sugar. And so we were buying healthy foods that were actually totally unhealthy, uh, even diet sodas would trigger uh, a, a fat gain mechanism because our, our, our sweet receptors would, would make us fall out of ketosis when we would have the zero calorie Coke because the body didn't know the difference. So uh, everything that the food industry was telling us was a lie and it was, it was making us sick as a society. And I began to think, you know, this is just so cruel because what, what we're told is that if you can't lose the weight, it's an individual failure. And we fall into this self-abasement when actually the cards are stacked against us, that the, the, the social reasons of the obesity epidemic aren't touched on because of the food industry, there's too much money to be gained. And, and like with energy consumption and all that, we, we fall into this pattern of saying, oh, it's the individual consumer that has to make the sacrifice, when in fact, everything is set up against them. Uh, and so, so that's where I think um, public health plays a role in this uh, and, and where we can do some good. Um, but I think we also have to remember 
that food itself is an ecstatic experience. Um, Michael Pollan, the author, said, what, he asked the question, what is the best diet? And he said, you can eat anything, but you have to make it yourself. And think about that for a moment. If you had to make ice cream when you wanted it, you wouldn't have it every day. You know, maybe once a month, maybe once a year. Uh, and at, and e even with cheese, for instance, I've started making my own artisanal cheese. So I don't have it every day because it, it takes too long, but it's really good, right? Uh, and, and so that got me to thinking about the evolution of our sugar consumption. As hunter-gatherers, if we came across a source of high carbohydrates, like a, a beehive or something like that, we would taste it and it would trigger a reaction to eat more than we needed so that we could store it, because at that time, famine was likely. And so it evolutionarily made sense that if we came across a high carbohydrate source, it would trigger a craving reaction to eat more than we needed so that we could literally store it for a rainy day. But that only works on an assumption of scarcity. So when in the Industrial Revolution, sugar became not an expensive luxury item, but very cheap and common, and now in most countries, government subsidized, um, our bodies didn't get the memo. They still functioned as if uh, famine was a part of human existence. So when we taste that sugar, we have more than what we will need. And since we have access to it cheaply every day, we binge. And, and so how do we break that cycle? And part of that, I think, is seeing food as an artistic, aesthetic experience. Uh, we talked a little bit about visual representations of, of obese people. Well, there's also in the visual arts this tradition of the still life, of looking at items of food, fruit, vegetables, meats, uh, painted. And it's not just a painterly exercise of the way light hits an object. It's an exercise in attention of being able to be mindful of these things that are an important part of our lives and not take them for granted. So if we can move away from the fast food, make it ourselves, and actually pay attention to the process, be aesthetically engaged to the smells, the textures, the sound of the, of the, the, the boiling water, or the, the sizzling meat, or the, or the sauteing vegetable, um, and, and, and start being living in that present moment, then we start breaking the cycle of, of the mass consumption. Um, and that emotional connection is also very important because food comforts us. If we go back to each one of us, our first moments of life, what is the first thing that happens in the chaos of being born, of being thrust from this comfortable dark world where everything is provided for us into this cold, bright, noisy outside world, outside of the womb? The first thing that happens that comforts us is our cheek is pressed against the mother's breast and we root to the nipple and have our first taste of sustenance. And then our eyes catch the eyes of the mother's gaze. And in that moment, in our midbrain, our ability to empathize is born in that mother's gaze. And we know that if that's interrupted, that child is more likely to become sociopathic because they never develop the ability to empathize which is one of the reasons why cell phones in, in many maternity wards are outlawed, because they realize that too many parents were too busy getting the selfie and they missed that moment. Which leads us also to this notion of social media. And as I was talking with uh, Jill last night over dinner, whom you're going to hear following me, um, I was telling her a little bit about my own body images as being a performer, and she pointed out that in today's society, all of our young people, because of social media, are in that state. That they are all constantly in performance and are constantly being minutely judged on their appearance through social media. How do we bring mindfulness into this next generation and start approaching those cultural issues? So lastly, I'm going to 
mention a couple of food interventions where we actually look at food as an art, but also as a health intervention. Uh, last June, uh, I helped organize with Renee Fleming uh, the LA Arts and Health Week. And we had, uh, like the Budapest Opera House, a, a wonderful uh, meeting at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I sang a song today, because I wanted to plausibly say, oh, I sang at the Budapest uh, Opera House, and be truthful. Yeah. Uh, it's the only way I could have done it. <laughs> Slipped it in there. Um, uh, but we also had activations throughout the city, uh, Parkinson's and Dance, uh, uh, Childhood th Children's Theater in uh, East LA of the Hispanic community uh, on uh, breaking COVID stigma. But the one that interests me for this discussion was something we did in Koreatown, where a study was done by the local organization to show the mental health crisis that was happening in Koreatown during the pandemic. And two demographic groups in particular felt extreme feelings of isolation, loneliness, and suicidal self-harming thoughts. And they were the teenagers and the older people. And the older people in particular, when they tried to make an intervention, resisted traditional mental health support. It just wasn't part of their culture. They were embarrassed. They, they didn't want to be stigmatized by that. Um, it, it, it made no sense to them, and they refused it. So then they took a different tact. They asked, well, what is most important to you? And they said, the fact that the younger generation isn't picking up the food ways of our people. So they came up with an idea where they had this huge community kimchi training session where they brought in the elders and they brought in the teenagers and, and they framed it as, they, they called the teenagers not learners but correspondents. Uh, so there, the idea was that they would be shown the ways of making kimchi and they would bring it back to their families and their communities to sort of even the, the power relationships there. And it was amazing to watch because these older Korean women would literally get into the bowls of the pickled uh, cabbage and spices, holding the hands of the younger people, showing them how to gently fold it in. Uh, you, you could smell the smell of the fermenting uh, cabbage, which is actually more pleasant than it sounds. And, uh, and as they did it, the stories would come out of this woman in Seoul who had the best recipe, but that bitch died before she ever told it to anyone. So it, it, it was just this vibrant experience. And then the, the teenagers sharing with the older people, and it became more than just food. And just like that connection between the mother's milk and the gaze of the mother, there was this communal effect of the preparation and the consummation of food that was truly a communion. And there's a neurological basis for it. When we get the aesthetic pleasure of, of eating and sharing that validation with others, there's an oxytocin response, which is the hormone that is the bonding hormone of forming community. So there's, there's an actual mechanism of why this works. So now we're trying it in Atlanta to combat racism, uh, where instead of telling people why they shouldn't be racist, which rarely works, um, instead it's a community program of sharing dinners between races, where you're invited into people's homes and you trade recipes and you cook each other's food. And that's been a tremendous success. And you don't even have to talk about social justice. It, it, it comes out you know, through the shared experience. Now, in my case, after I lost all that weight, and I began to, for me, the, the critical turning point was, you know how it is when you look in the mirror every morning and you're shaving, and you, you don't see your face getting fatter over time? So I, I didn't quite understand how fat I was getting until one day when my son said to me when he was very small, Daddy, are you fat? And I, I guess I am. And he goes, or are you pregnant? <laughs> and that stuck with me. And as I began to successfully lose the rate, I, I, I began to imagine the new me that was being born from this gestation. And 
towards the end of my weight loss, where I actually was much lighter than I am now, uh, I began to realize, oh, I can eat anything in it, and I'm still losing weight. And I, I began this tremendous slide where I was getting very, very thin. And what I didn't realize was what was actually being born inside me as a result of my obesity was cancer. And that story I'm going to tell tomorrow morning. Thank you.